Well, hello, and thank you for listening. Of course, this is a very difficult topic. The suggestion that the Bible could be under the influence of some supernatural attack, like the Mandela effect, is, of course, ridiculous to the majority of believers. It does elicit a very visceral response, especially church leaders. And just for the record, I am a believer. I love the Lord. I'm a follower of the Lord. I love his word, Psalms 119. I love thy law, O Lord. So I have no axe to grind. I'm not, you know, like an apologist for the devil. I'm not spreading doubt and unbelief in the body of Christ. I am just trying to respond to a phenomenon. It's undeniably a phenomenon. And there's hundreds of thousands, according to my research, of Christians waving their arms with their eyes bugged out, claiming their Bibles are supernaturally changing, and the, and the upper echelons of the body of Christ, if I could put it that way, are silent. And this needs to be taken seriously. And so if you are listening to this, and you can put me in touch with pastors or board members at a denomination or at a Bible college or a Christian publishing house or Christian media, please reach out to me. Or if you yourself would be willing to come on my channel and discuss this topic with us or have a formal debate, I have a person that will mediate a debate, please, please, we're begging you to hear us out. I want a formal presentation for two hours with church leaders and influencers. My email is pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com. My website, you can contact me through there, is wakeuporelse.com. So this overview will show you how this event can be happening without impugning God's character in any way. See, the scriptures do not have a force field around them as you've been taught from the front of the room for your entire Christian life. It is God's word and God himself that are forever settled in heaven, not the scriptures. The scriptures that deliver God's word to us, they are not the same. If providential preservation was completely and comprehensively true, we would not have things like the Watchtower's New World Translation or other blasphemous perversions. And so as we look at scriptures like Psalms 12, verse 6, and others like it, that are presented as proof that the Mandela effect would never be able to change the Bible, and we suggest that they are being misunderstood, we see an extreme offense taken by Christians. They reject the authenticity of, of this claim because they equate the Bible changing with God being unfaithful. It's a direct attack on the faithfulness and righteousness of God in their mind. This very sharp response is because they see this as us accusing God of being a liar. But we in the Mandela Effect community do not believe God is a liar. Numbers 23, God is not a man that he should lie. Hebrews 6, 18, it is impossible for God to lie. I can't speak for everyone, but most of us that I know believe that the scriptures are inspired. They're God-breathed. They're of no man's personal interpretation. We're not espousing extra-biblical beliefs. We're adhering to the immutability of the original autographs. So that which was spoken will come to pass and will not change. However, the terrestrial book is able to be manipulated, regardless of the promises that rely on your position. You see, outside of a vision from God, it would have been impossible for Bible scholars for the past 2,000 years to rightly divide the word regarding this issue. It would have been necessary for them to have first observed this phenomenon, as we have, as you certainly can, before 
they would be able to have interpreted the passages that I will show you pertaining to this event. And this would have been impossible because the event is fairly recent, as far as we can tell. And so this appears to be what was meant by Daniel, who was given a prophetic word to shut up the words until the time of the end, which I would propose that we are in now. So this passage is fulfilled in your hearing. <laughs> And what was it that God was saying would be shut up until the time of the end? It was the prophecy that came before these words in Daniel 12. It's Daniel 7.25. It is here that the God of heaven clearly warned you that the devil would attempt to change the Bible. Did you know that your very own Bible teaches you that in the last hours of the church age, which we are now in, the beast would be allowed by God to use his little parlor tricks to attempt to supernaturally change the Bible. Yes, it's there in verse 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws. Now, I'm not taking this passage out of context because it is clearly an end times prophecy. I don't think anyone would debate that. So it's talking about the end days. Nor am I misinterpreting this to fit my twisted beliefs. I just disagree with you respectfully. So your argument that this passage is just talking about calendars and natural laws is unconvincing to me. The Bible, my Bible, speaks unapologetically about radically supernatural things. It is man's misguided tendency, however, to try to consistently tone down the meaning of these writings to fit his more naturalistic worldview that is manageable to him. He's comfortable with that. But I'm a supernaturalist. I believe the Bible. And so these pompous words referenced here will be spoken from the enemy's mouth in due time. But right now, there are pompous words beginning to appear in your Bibles, all translations, and it's happening right under your nose with all due respect because you're blinded by a pet doctrine that the Bible can't change. Do you see that word laws? It's Strong's 1882. It's translated the law of God in other passages like Ezra 7.14, there it is in the Strong's, and there it is in Ezra 7.14. The same word that's translated law of your God is translated laws in Daniel 7. And so it is not us that's under a strong delusion, dear soul, it's you. And if you have the temerity to continue to listen to what I'm saying by the time I'm done here, you will finally have what you need to admit to yourself that this is happening. So I encourage you to stay with me. This is not a TikTok two-minute video. Of course, if you do stay with me and you do reluctantly concede that this is happening, I must warn you that it will probably mean the end of your ministry, your reputation, and possibly your marriage, as I've lost mine over this, if your spouse does not follow you into this unavoidable conclusion, you're going to have a very difficult road. But that is a matter for the great anvil of prayer. Of course, the rich young ruler failed that test, and he was devout from his youth up. I hope for your sake that you will fare better than the rich young ruler. Uh, this is just yet another opportunity that God has extended to the body of Christ to accept his invitation to forsake all and follow him. Because what I can assure you is that publicly acknowledging that the Bible is supernaturally changing will bring a persecution down upon your head that is on par with the Spanish Inquisition. So did you know that the following instruction is in your Bible? 
Do not protect the Bible from Satan. That's in your Bible. That kind of throws a little bit of a monkey wrench into the doctrine of the preservation of Scripture or accuracy or inerrancy. It's a modifier. It's Revelation 22. Now, of course, no one probably would be coming to that interpretation unless you were looking for it. And why would you, unless you had witnessed and accepted the authenticity of this phenomenon for yourself first? And then going back into the Word like we have to see if what you were seeing could be supported by Scripture. So we all said, God, if this is really happening, am I delusional? If this is happening, you have to show me in your Word. Well, we found Daniel 7.25, and we found Thessalonians 2, 2 Thessalonians 2, where Paul says, Ascribing to the Antichrist, he has all power. That's a pretty powerful metaphor. And here in Revelation 22, if you realize that this word seal means a mark as to protect from Satan, then it does appear to be a fair interpretation that this passage is now saying, protect not from Satan the prophecy of this book. This could be seen as a bookend of sorts to the Daniel 12 directive to shut up the words of the Daniel 7 prophecy until the end. Then we're now at the other end of that where the time for this prophecy of the Bible changing being hidden from man is now to be revealed and so we have the other end of that where the word of the angel is, okay, it's now the fullness of time. No longer are you to protect the Bible from Satan. I'm sorry, but this is in the Bible and I'm experiencing this and I have to find if God's word has addressed this and I believe it has. The Daniel 7.25 prediction that the beast would be permitted to change the Bible was hidden from man as we were told in Daniel 12, 4. But in the fullness of time, Revelation 22 would be fulfilled and the words of the angel here would be permitted. Do not protect the Bible from Satan. The words of the prophecy could be only limited to the book of Revelation, but in this case, the Bible's fairly cryptic in its presentation of reality. So, do not protect the Bible from Satan seems to be there as a fair interpretation. And if this is correct, it would give a whole new meaning to what comes directly after it, which says, he who is unjust, let him stay unjust. So basically, if you take the sharp influence of the scriptures out of this world, men will be at a great disadvantage to find their way to God. So they'll be fixed in their present condition. And understand, it's just human sentiment that would argue that this is so terrible that God would allow it. He wouldn't allow it uh, because it's too horrible. Well, of course he would, because first of all, it is happening. And he told you in advance that it would happen. And it's his judgment. It's supposed to be terrible. <laughs> it's not a happy message. And God is not suddenly betraying you and going back on his word because he's allowing this because there is yet another prophet that was given a clear vision of this event. And it is here that you will find relief from the apparent biblical paradox that this event would seem to create. In other words, how can God promise his word will not change and then allow it to change? Of course, to the natural mind, that would be a paradox. But the answer to that is simply the idea of inaccessibility. So the pagan in the jungle does not have access to the saving words of the gospel, but do theologians and believers the world over hold God in derision as being unrighteous because of that? No. No, because God turns the wicked into hell and all the nations that forget God. Why would missionaries go to the foreign fields if they didn't believe that the 
pagan was going to be lost without their message. No, inaccessibility is this widely accepted without holding God in derision. So in a similar way, God's judgment on the bride of Christ to remove the biblical lampstand, so to speak, through the agency of the devil and free will results in a similar inaccessibility. And this is exactly what we see from Amos in chapter 8, verse 11. And this passage is widely held to be an end times prophecy because, first of all, it is tied to an end times celestial event that is also in Revelation. And then, of course, it has the same reference that Daniel 12 has, that men will be traveling to and fro. And so Amos saw in this vision that the word of God would become completely inaccessible. And he described it as a famine, not of bread, but of the word, and that men would travel to and fro and not be able to find it. Well, how could that be possible with the Bible being stored in so many different formats? It wouldn't be possible, even if they banned the Bible. Well, the answer is it wouldn't be possible for Amos's prophecy to be fulfilled. The supernatural Bible changes, however, would fulfill the Amos prophecy perfectly. Additionally, how would it be possible that even the very elect would be deceived? That always was a struggle for me. We all consider ourselves pretty sharp. We're pressing into the kingdom. Right? God's speaking in our ear. How are they gonna how is the devil gonna be able to deceive even the very elect? Well, the answer is by slowly and subtly changing the words and meanings in the scriptures over time. Combined with the strong bias that God would never allow such a thing, has resulted in a great deception taking place that is in fact happening with about 99% of the body of Christ, as far as I can see. The inability for believers, and especially church leaders, to perceive this phenomenon is nothing short of breathtaking. What is the matter with you people? But even against all these proofs, the unconvinced will still argue that the devil doesn't have that much power. And of course, that will be true unless God gave him the power. So this, of course seems to be exactly what is described by John, the Revelator, in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation. And the context here in verse 2 clearly establishes that the dragon is given both the ability and the authority to the beast to wage war against the saints and prevail. But how could this be possible unless God had ordained it through the agency of free will? And so, in Revelation 13, 7, the beast is given both permission and power to carry out such a thing as supernaturally changing the Bible. Because it says he was given power and authority to prevail against the saints. Well, that would certainly fall into that category. And I'll do some examples at the end here for you specific Bible changes, and you'll get them mostly wrong because that's what happens every time. But this video is not really going to use that as proof. My approach here is going to be to look at the underlying core beliefs that are keeping you back from accepting the proof or even considering it. Because we know a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And the idea that we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are, is very true. We all look through rose-colored glasses. And what we in the community observe consistently is the tendency of the unconvinced to not know and not want to know. Our meetings are cut short. Our, our pastors get agitated with us. They, they accuse us of being demon-possessed and needing medication. I mean, this is 
This is universally the response that we get. And the majority of believers are acting like a six year old with their fingers in their ears saying, no, 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 I can't hear you. It's pathetic. It is outrageous. The delusion that you think is upon us is actually upon you. And delusion means that you believe what's untrue and you're resistant to facts. That is somebody that's delusional. They're in la la land. They think, you know, pink elephants are flying around and you're like, no, pink elephants are not flying around. You're delusional. Well, we're going to look at this. And what I'm going to demonstrate very clearly is that the unconvinced are demonstrating all the characteristics of delusion, not the Mandela effect community. The unconvinced fulfills both these definitions to a T. The way that your delusion manifests itself is through the decision not to examine the biblical analysis and the questions that I'm about to provide you. That means you're resistant to facts. I'm presenting facts. And if you deny yourself to, for whatever reason, you don't have time, you know, it's impossible. I'm not going to waste my time. That's being resistant to facts. I will show you how the Bible can be changing without impugning God's character in any way. And that's pretty much the biggest challenge I think that most believers have with this. God's promises are still true and immutable regardless of this happening. Okay, so just for a moment, I would ask you to set aside all of the impossible biblical paradoxes and doctrinal conundrums that this phenomenon would seem to create. And set aside the offense and the indignation that you have towards us for claiming that this is taking place and just follow me as a detective. Okay, unbiased, unemotional, as I ask you some questions that I believe could help you to understand what is happening truly. And so assume for just a moment that this phenomenon is in fact taking place. What proof do you have? What proof would you need, rather, to be convinced that the Bible is supernaturally changing? What's it going to take to convince you? How overt and plentiful would these changes need to be before you would be willing to concede that this is happening? Now, is the thought that comes in behind that question, <clears throat> well, I would never concede the Bible's changing. Well, that's delusion. That's being resistant to facts. This is not going to steal your soul if you are willing to consider this. That's what Aristotle said. The mark of an intelligent man is the ability to consider a matter without embracing it. That's all I'm asking. Okay, this is not like the atheist that's trying to suggest that there is no God. My claim is actually based on the authority of Scripture verifiable empirical evidence and the testimony of hundreds of thousands of believers. So if you're a follower of Christ, then you and I are probably very similar and we share most of the same passions for the Lord and his kingdom and the beliefs about his claims and the doctrines of scripture. And so try not to be reactionary. Okay. Is it possible? Is it possible that you're misunderstanding the teaching? that the Bible can't change. Because it turns out that there are significant groups within Orthodox Christianity that have never believed that the Bible teaches that it can't be changed. This is Blue Letter Bible quoting from Don Stewart's research. You can see this on educatingourworld.com that there is, this is, a widely held belief among Orthodox believers. There is no providential preservation taught in Scripture. One side says there is nothing in Scripture which promises God's word will be providentially preserved. While they do not deny the written word of God has been preserved throughout history, they do not believe that any passage of Scripture clearly teaches this to be true. In other words, while the providential preservation of Scripture has actually happened in history, Nothing found in the Bible makes this a necessity. This is my position. This is not heretical. And so we need to tone down the rhetoric that we're 
heretics and charlatans and we're going to split hell wide open. Do you believe that the term scripture and the phrase the word of God are the same thing? Because if you look at all the proof texts that you're drawing from to assert your position, how many of them specifically say that the scriptures will not change? Here on the screen, you have quite a few different words to, are used by the Bible to refer to the Bible. And you have to ask yourself, do they all mean the same thing? And then according to John 1, the word existed before the scripture was written. So how can they be the same thing? This is not blasphemy. This is me trying to respond to what my eyes are seeing and in the confirmation of hundreds of thousands of other people seeing this. See, you can refree yourself right now from a lifetime of sloppy theology, what I believe is just dogma opposed, imposed on us as doctrine, and a semantic distinction that has possibly never been presented to you before. It never dawned on me to look more closely at this idea. I always believed that the Bible couldn't change, but I never really looked at it. The idea that scriptures and the term word of God are the same thing. Well, let's read this passage here, if the scripture and the word are the same thing, then I should be able to exchange the two and read through this passage and have it have the same meaning. Okay, so let's try that. In the beginning was the scripture. And the scripture was with God. And the scripture was God. Well, I don't know about you, but that doesn't hit me the right way. The scripture was in the beginning with God. All things were made through the scripture and without the scripture, nothing was made that was made. In the scripture was life and the life was no, it's this is not working. OK, and, and you know, this is not. Twisting the Bible to meet my twisted beliefs, I'm just looking for the truth. I mean, do you have a firm grasp of the difference between the concept of providential preservation and the doctrines of accuracy and errancy? So they're not the same. And of course, there are at least nine passages that I was able to find where God commands us to remember. And so do you think if God commands us to remember nine different times, that we would be able to carry out that command? If God commands you to remember, do you think you're capable of remembering? Well, if the answer is yes, then do you think that that is an indication that the human memory is reliable? Because the number one argument that I receive from learned men and women of God is, well, John, you can't trust the human memory. Well, I think I've dispelled that misconception by pointing out that God commands you to remember. And so if you agree that the human memory is reliable, would you agree then that it is intellectually dishonest to simply dismiss the testimony of hundreds of thousands of believers that are claiming that what they are experiencing is not misremembering? You see, we're adults. We know the difference. And my wife for instance, who I love dearly, did not end our 24 year marriage over something that is on the same level as me losing my keys or forgetting where I parked. The experience that I am experiencing and that actually you are as well, you just come to a different conclusion. But all of those in the Mandela effect is closer to when you go to visit your aging parent and they don't recognize who you are. That is not misremembering. That is a catastrophic memory failure. So we see hundreds of different vivid memories, vivid memories that no longer exist exactly as we remember them. This is turning our lives upside down. This is not, you know, quirky misremembering. So please stop saying that, please. 
It's delusional to suggest that we are misremembering. You have to come up with a different explanation than, well, you can't trust the human memory. That is not true. It's not our experience. It's not supported by the fact that the courts use the memory as evidence or long term studies prove that long term memory is reliable. So just stop it. What's actually happening is we're being miscategorized by people that don't want this to be true and have not done the research. Because if all of this is just misremembering, how do you explain such a large number of things being misremembered by such a large number of people? And they're misremembering it exactly the same. See, studies show that when groups of people misremember, they see an accident or something, it's usually only about 10% will misremember the same way. And so sociological studies and studies of this have shown that anything over that five or 10% mark where people are misremembering it the same way is an anomaly. Well, you can do this yourself. You can test people with examples of the Mandela effect and you'll have 90%. You ask them, what did the witch say in front of the mirror in the seven dwarfs? Mirror, mirror on the wall. That's what they'll tell you. And 90% will tell you that. But they'll all be wrong. And you could do that with hundreds of examples. <laughs> hundreds in multiple categories. So it's thousands. That is a phenomenon. Wouldn't you agree? that that's a phenomenon. And so if the Bible says in the mouth of two or more witnesses, let all things be established. Why are you dismissing our testimony as foolishness? How do you explain the vast number of examples of residual evidence that exist that supports our vivid memories? It'd be one thing if all we had was our vivid memories, but we're able to go out easily into the data sphere and find hundreds of examples of evidence, artifacts that support our vivid memories. These things should not exist. Who put them there? How do you explain that all of us in this community have observed four different flip flops over the last four years? And if you don't know what those are, how could you have any hope of persuading us that we are somehow deceived? You don't even know what a flip flop is one of the most powerful sources of evidence that we have. This is where the whole community observed and reported on a major change like Flintstones lost its T now it's Flintstones. And then six, eight months later, it changed back again, right in front of us. Same thing with Chuck E. Cheese, Houston, we have a problem and Kit Kats or not Kit Kats, Tidy Cats became Tidy Cat and then it changed back again. So don't lecture me that I'm misremembering because you haven't done your research. And it's many of us were convinced in pop culture and outside before we even knew the Bible was changing. And so we already knew this phenomenon was taking place. And then we came to the Bible and we started to see things in our Bible that were vivid memories that were completely unfamiliar. This is inescapable. This flip flop thing is probably the most compelling proof that I know of. I mean, the only possible explanation I can think of that you can offer is that we're seeing things. But if you had been standing next to me, if you were in and around us during these events, you would have seen them as well. So if we're seeing things, so are you. So I guess you don't want to admit that. So you'd have to go with the idea that we're just liars. So if it's not that, if you're not going to go there, I think you're out of excuses. I, I think you just need to repent of being arrogant and stubborn. I'm sorry, but the time is short and the unconvinced are telling us that we're going to hell while they can't offer us any meaningful explanations for these things that are clearly happening. You, sir, 
You, ma'am, are delusional. You are the one that is resistant to facts, not us. We are here with complex overviews like this, presenting facts, showing you that it is clear that all of humanity is experiencing the Mandela effect. If you look at this, what's on your screen, the fruit of the loom cornucopia is like 100% of people will tell you, oh, the one on the left is the one that I remember, yet it never existed. The one on the right is what exactly has always existed. If you go back to the original trademark, it's the one on the right. So it hasn't changed somewhere along the way. These are compelling proofs that are just being brushed aside by people that don't want this to be true because it upends their entire worldview. But remember, Pharaoh's magicians threw down a staff and it became a snake. So we have one solid biblical example of the devil's crowd being able to mess with reality. Okay, so it is doctrinally supported that this type of thing could happen. But you ask any number of people in a room, you know, which Ford logo looks familiar to you, they're going to tell you the bottom one, but it's never been that one all the way back to the original. It always had this little pigtail or Smokey the Bear never existed. It has always been Smokey Bear all the way back to the original thing in like 1958 or whatever. Cheez-Its never existed, which is what people still say all the time. And then of course, how many people are in the Jackson 5? What's your best guess? <laughs> of course, it's six. As you can see here, all the way back to the beginning, well, it was five until they became the Jacksons. No, here's the picture when they were little kids. There's six of them. There they are. And you have this magazine that even shows on the right five of them, but then on the left, you see six signatures. So these are the types of things that we're seeing as proof. And so we're not just misremembering. So if we're the ones coming up with facts and you're running away and throwing rocks at us from a distance, it's not us that's delusional, it's you. And so if the answer to these two questions of whether or not we're seeing things, we're psychotic, that's no, because if that's true, so are you. Or are we delusional? And that's no. I've effectively eliminated the assumption that we're psychotic or delusional, we're not seeing things that aren't there, we're not resistant to facts. Well, what is it then? There's nothing in recorded history ever recorded where hundreds of thousands of people were suddenly universally struck with the same mental illness at the same time, having the same symptoms of all misremembering the same things the same way but that's what's happened. Would you agree that that in itself is a phenomenon? And you don't have to agree that reality is morphing or some experience like that. But if I have effectively eliminated delusion and psychosis and misremembering as explanations for what we're claiming that, what do you have left? The testimony of all of us remains unexplained and is therefore a phenomenon. Would you agree? If you yourself are experiencing the same memories we are, we're not delusional or psychotic, and we have not been struck with mental illness, then what is it? How is it possible that there are hundreds of mistakes for hundreds of different things in a multitude of categories in newspapers.com, which is digitized newspaper display ads and all kinds of stuff going back 50 years. Even over a 50 year period, finding maybe 10 to 20 different errors in display ads for one product would be a lot. Where they, where they, I'm talking about the name of the product being incorrectly spelled. We, however, are able to find hundreds, even thousands of errors where the product name is incorrect for one product alone. And then there are hundreds of products, each with hundreds of errors. 
Then there are other categories that you can go into newspapers.com and you can find the names of people wrongly entered into the newspaper. Books, movie quotes, events in history, all of them piling the improbability higher and higher upon one another. This represents an insurmountable mountain of residual evidence that cannot be explained away as just the average number of errors that might take place in the normal course, course of business. This is preposterous. If the scripture can't be changed, why did Paul order it to be changed? In Leviticus 23, 4, these are the feasts of the Lord, even the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. That was the word of God to his people. And yet, Paul comes along in Colossians 2.16 and undoes that. Now, again, you can have a commentary for the reason the ceremonial law was no longer required and we're transitioning from the Old Testament to the New Testament, but that's not my point. My point is that the scripture can be changed. That's all I'm trying to point out is that there's a precedent for scripture changing itself or being changeable. And then, of course, in Deuteronomy 4, 2, you shall not add unto the word which I commanded you. So if that's true, why do we have any scripture added after this passage? Or Leviticus 3.17, it is a perpetual statute throughout your generations in all your dwellings. You shall not eat any fat or any blood. But then Paul comes along and completely undoes that by saying, do not destroy the work of God in Romans 4.20 for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to let his eating be a stumbling block. And then you have this example here. If the scripture can't be changed, why do we have an account of there needing to be adjustments to doctrine made on the fly? Galatians 2, Peter had come to Antioch. He withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. This is Paul was stooding Peter to the face because Peter was trying to teach the ceremonial law to the New Testament believers and the doctrine had to be corrected. So in a similar way, we have Jesus teaching that the scripture can be changed. Matthew 12, 3, he answered, haven't you read what David did? When he and his companions were hungry, he entered the house of God and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do. So there was a higher law, the law, the right to life superseded the law around the showbread. So the precedent that one passage can override another passage is in your Bible. So in a similar way, the promises that the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times, you, O Lord, will keep them, you will guard us from this generation forever, is a foundational passage, proof text, that the Bible could not be changed by the Mandela effect, could potentially be modified as well by Daniel 7.25. It's just one of a number of different proofs that I'm trying to put forth to make sense out of this phenomenon. Because if you're like me, you believe this is happening. And then, of course, we have Jeremiah 8.8, 8, which is a fairly interesting passage. Because how could you say that the Bible can't be changed when the Bible describes an incident where the Bible was changed? Jeremiah 8.8, 8, how can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us. Look, the false pen of the scribe certainly works falsehood. <laughs> if you read the commentaries, it's clear 
I don't know exactly what was meant by this, but it does sound very much like it does that there was some shenanigans going on with the scribes and they were changing the meaning of the scripture. Okay, so if the Bible isn't changing, why does Paul say that he robbed churches in every known translation of the Bible? It's not a translation confusion because it's in all translations. And the original Greek supports the translation of it in English. The original Greek is rob or despoil. It means he stole. Now, here it is, uh, all the translations on the right. It says, I robbed, I robbed, I robbed. It's not a confusion with another translation. And so you and I both know that the fact that the Bible is teaching that Paul said that he robbed churches is shocking and indefensible. Please do not insult my intelligence by telling me it's a bad translation because the underlying original meaning is that he robbed them, he stole from them. And it's also possibly the first time you have ever known that this is in your Bible, which is the greatest indi indication that the Bible is supernaturally changing. How can this and 30 other passages like it ever escaped your notice until now? I mean, if, if you don't acknowledge that that is near impossible, then you're resistant to facts. You're displaying delusion. I mean, how many examples would I have to give you like this before you would admit that something unexplainable is happening? Right? David prayed... Lord, put a watch over my lips. So why didn't God correct Paul's decision to use the term, I robbed the churches, knowing that it would give license to criminals? I'm sure I would have had the presence of mind to say to myself, well, you know, I better not use that imagery to express what I'm doing because some, of, some people might take it wrong. I mean, I got enough common sense not to use that type of imagery, which he did. No. This has been changed by the devil to wear down the saints and to usher in the Antichrist. So when he comes on the scene, he's going to have a book which all the believers are going to follow because they have this doctrine. And that's how the very elect will be deceived. Now, I know you're chomping at the bit to give me a reasonable commentary on why this robbing the churches thing makes total sense and how it can be understood in a godly way. But I don't care. OK, all I care about is do you remember this? And is this the first time that this was ever come to your attention? And if this was the only example of this kind of heresy in your Bible, I can understand your reluctance. But we have hundreds of these now. What is the matter with you? What is your problem? How could you be so consecrated to God and so bewitched at the same time. If I'm delusional, that means I'm resistant to facts. But my question to you is what facts am I resistant to? Is it your superficial claim that, that you and I are just misremembering? No, I've considered this idea at great length. And I have just laid out some, not all, of the reasons why misremembering as an explanation for this phenomenon is more irrational than suggesting that your reality is being manipulated because that's what God told us was going to happen. Did you believe the promise of Psalms 119.89? That this promise also applies to Paul's request for Timothy to bring his jacket? See, I've had to begin to look at the meaning of the word and the word, meaning of the word scripture. So Paul says, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. Don't forget to bring my jacket. Okay, is this scripture 
on the same level of an authority, let's say, as Moses being told the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, it comes from God's mouth to the tablets of stone. But are we to also consider Paul's mundane direction to fetch his jacket on the same level of revelation, meaning and importance as God's booming voice giving Moses the Ten Commandments? Are both of these passages of Scripture to be considered the Word of God? Now, this is not something I ever wandered into. If I believe the Bible is supernaturally changing, then I must assume that the Bible is not teaching that it cannot change because it is changing. And with that assumption, many of us went back into the Word and found that the Bible did not clearly teach that scriptures cannot change. It says your Word cannot change. And we made the distinction between those two terms. And that distinction eliminated any biblical paradoxes for us. Because when God gave the original autographs to the original authors, and it says, thy word is forever settled in heaven. That's still true. Thou shalt not commit adultery, could say in my Bible, thou shalt not eat ice cream cones, but it's still true that I should not commit adultery. So the laws and edicts of God are still in effect, but the Bible is under attack. Now, this is how you can absolutely know that this is happening what I'm about to share with you. And then I'm going to give you the quiz and you can see for yourself. Okay, follow me on this. If you were to ask a commercial airline pilot that had 30 years experience and an impeccable record, 10 simple instrument questions, how many do you think that he would be able to accurately identify? I'm just asking you, what are these instruments here Simply, what do they do? How many would he get right? Most people have asked that have said he'd probably get them all right. I mean, how would he be able to be a pilot and have an impeccable record if he couldn't even identify the instruments? OK, and the same thing with a doctor. If you have a doctor who's practiced medicine for 30 years, he's board certified, he's the chief medical advisor of the hospital, all that, and you're going to give him 10 basic anatomy questions. Nothing real complicated. How many is he going to get right? Of course, he's going to get them all right. Well, now you have a King James only pastor who's been in the ministry for 30 years, and you're going to give him 10 simple Bible quiz questions, not out of the book of Ezekiel. Okay, just, you know, quote John 316 or what's Genesis 1 1 simple. How many is the pastor going to get right? He's a King James only pastor, and I'm giving him the King James Bible. How many is he going to get right, dear soul? He's going to get them all right. And you know it. And what is happening is he's getting them all wrong. And I could do it with one after another after another. Why? Because his Bible is supernaturally changing. That's the only explanation. It can't be mental illness because I can do it with one after another. Do they all have mental illness? No. So how many would you have to get wrong before you'd be willing to admit something unexplainable was happening? I'm going to give you an opportunity here in a second. I'm going to ask you some Bible questions. And I want you to resist the temptation to try to explain why your wrong answer is valid because of some sort of commentary. The only thing I'm interested in for you to experience is two things. Did you remember it correctly? And is this the first time this passage has ever come to your attention? That's it. Those two things should be sufficient to you to come to the only logical conclusion and that is that the Bible is supernaturally changed. For many people, it was seeing one word. I remember this one lady, she was 75 years old. She said, John, I opened my King James Bible and it said they put their money in the bank and I knew my Bible was changed. So this memory quiz only deals with your memory. Is it correct? Do you, do you remember it correctly? Yes or no? And was this the first time this passage came to you? Okay. And 
I just remind you that you're before the Holy Spirit. So please just be honest with yourself because none of us wants this to be true. Just try not to make yourself out to be smarter than God, okay? Don't resist what you know is happening. Okay, so here we go. In all of your study of the Bible, did God ever instruct his people to offer the sacrifice of a female lamb? Yes or no? Quickly. In your memory, is there anything in the Bible that says offer a lamb? It's a female lamb. Yes or no? Okay. If you said no, you'd be incorrect. Leviticus 4.32 and if he bring a lamb for a sin offering, he shall bring it a female without blemish. Okay, how many times does your Bible mention unicorns? Okay, the answer is nine. Now, if if you had no grid for that, that's a, it's a first time you've ever realized your Bible says this is universal. This is in all Bibles. Well, that should be shocking to you. And, and I know you're going to want to say, well, it means ox. I don't care. I only care if you memorize, if your memory is not catastrophically failing you. And if it's the first time it's ever come to you, because at a certain point, you have to begin to take notice of the fact that the doctor gets all 10 right and the pilot gets all 10 right, but the pastor gets all 10 wrong. It's not possible. Okay. You're resistant to facts. That is an empirical observation that is very compelling. Okay. It's very compelling and you need to really acknowledge that. Okay. How many times did the Bible use the term pisseth against the wall? Zero, one, two. How about six? There, are, there they are right there. Does the Bible ever refer to anyone eating their own dung and drinking their own piss? Quickly, yes or no? Yes, Isaiah 36, 12. When Moses and Aaron confronted Pharaoh, who threw down his staff? Was it Moses or Aaron? What did your memory tell you? Well, it was Aaron. Most people remember Moses. According to Matthew 8, 28, how many demoniacs were there when Jesus came out of the boat? Quickly. Well, if you said one, you'd be incorrect. There was two. This is, this is extremely unfamiliar to me. In your memory, did the people ever bring infants to Jesus so that he could touch them? Not children, infants. Yes or no? Well, the answer is yes. Luke 18, 15. They also brought infants to him that he might touch them. In your memory, did Jesus ever baptize anyone? Do you remember ever reading Jesus baptizing? Well, in John 3, 22, after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. It's foreign to me. Was Hagar Abraham's wife or his concubine? Quickly, what is your memory? Was Hagar Abraham's wife or his concubine? Well, if you said concubine, you would be incorrect because Genesis 16, 3 clearly says that, gave, that Sari gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Okay? Now, the rest of these questions are fill in the blanks. Now, this first one here is so familiar. It's in the lexicon of everyone's language. And it's along the lines where Job was defending God's honor. And he was saying, you know, shall we not receive good and evil from the hand of the Lord? So Job 121, and he said, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord blanks and the Lord blanks away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is King James. These next two are King James only. The Lord blank and the Lord blanks away. Well, if you said the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, you would be incorrect 
that doesn't appear in any translation. King James says, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Now, if this does not stop you in your tracks, then you're bewitched. That's all I can tell you. You're under some sort of spell. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away doesn't exist in any translation. The Lord gave and the Lord shall take away. No. How about this one? King James. Judge not, blank ye be judged. What would you fill in that blank? Well, if you said judge not, lest ye be judged, you would be incorrect because the King James clearly says judge not, that ye be not judged. And my most common response to this is, well, it's just one word. But again, that's commentary. Okay, all I'm looking for is your memory. And is this the first time this has come to your attention? Think about that. If you got it wrong, that is an empirical observation. And if it's the first time it ever came to you. And second of all, it's not one word. It's actually two words. Judge not lest you be judged is five words. And judge not that ye be not judged is seven words. It's completely different cadence. It's completely different. And what's, what's so mind-boggling, the lengths that the unconvinced will go to, to stay in their lane, is they will try to convince me that the reason that we're remembering judge not lest you be judged is that some time ago there was some preacher that misquoted it or there was some song or some hymn that misquoted it and that went through the entire world like the telephone game and i'm i'm sitting here going you're gonna go with that that's that is your answer because first of all, the telephone game, you're not allowed to tell the person down the line. So the rules are different. This is out in the open. So you have all, all of humanity, all of the Christians reading their Bibles every day. Then they're listening to other people teach from their Bibles. They're meditating on these passages. They're memorizing their passages. They're reading them in, in devotionals. And all of the influence of all that work is overcome by one person's sermon 50 years ago. That's what you're going to go with to explain this? No. Where did it come from? How did it get into the memories, the vivid, instant, spontaneous, self-evident memories of every person in the world? Because this one is quoted by saint and sinner alike. Judge not lest you be judged. No, that never existed. It's judge not that you be not judged. Do you understand the problem that we have with the misremembering argument? It is irrational. And now that you're being having it presented, if you don't calm down and fit, uh, seriously look at this, then you're delusional. I mean, how many of these would you have to get right before you're willing to admit something unexplainable is happening? Okay, because here we go. Who laid down with the lamb? Isaiah eleven six. Do you remember? Who laid down with the lamb? Well, if you said the lion, you would be incorrect. It's the wolf. And then we have in Genesis 8, where Noah sent the dove out to find the land and the dove comes back and it had something in its mouth. What was in its mouth? Do you remember? He had something of an olive plant. Was it a branch? Is that what you remember? Because if that was your memory, you would be incorrect. What it actually says is lo in her mouth was an olive plant leaf plucked off plucked is in spelled incorrectly because that's another thing that we see with the mandela effect is wild grammatical and punctuation errors throughout your bible now which are just dismissed as oh that's just the king james no 
King James is a literary masterpiece, and I have copies of numerous other books written in the same vernacular, and they're flawless. So it's just the Bible. All right, so when Jacob was left alone, he wrestled with someone till daybreak. Who was it? Do you recall who Jacob wrestled with? I think it was an angel, don't you? No, it was a man. He wrestled with a man. That's in every translation. And your first inclination is just to think, well, I don't know everything in the Bible. Human memory can't be trusted. Yes, it can. I told you earlier that God commanded you to remember, and he wouldn't do that if you weren't capable of it. So that's a lie. Your memory is just fine, thank you. And the fact that I do this with a hundred pastors in a row and they all say an angel is very compelling evidence that this is actually happening. And now I've given you biblical, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Permission. You have biblical permission to believe this because now you know that there are passages which can be interpreted as, in, as predicting this happening. And you have theological permission that this is just similar to inaccessibility. So, and it's not scripture and the word are not the same. So you now can embrace this without God being a liar. And now you're looking at the evidence, but you still have the rich young ruler problem because if you believe this, then you've got a big problem. You could lose everything. You might not, but you probably will. And so that could cause you to go the other way. But you see here that is this passage is in every translation. It's not a translation confusion. All of them say man. So how is it that every believer and every pastor will tell you that he wrestled with an angel? How? Come on, man. This is not one or two. This is 20, 30 of them. I'm only going to give you a small sampling. All right. Exodus 12, 23. Who came to the Egyptians to kill the firstborn? Do you remember? Most people will tell you the angel of death. I hear people say it all the time. I heard somebody say it yesterday. The angel of death. No, that's what we all remember. But if you go to any translation in Exodus 12, 23, it will say the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. There's no way out of this. Okay, there's no commentarying your way out of this catastrophic memory failure. It doesn't matter if you have some sort of reasonable explanation. And if you go to the commentaries and you find these specific translations is discussed from Matthew Henry in the 1500s, that is not proof that we're misremembering. What you are seeing is the fact that the Mandela effect is much more exotic than you ever comprehended because all of history changes with these changes. So that is not proof that we're just misremembering. That is just proof that this phenomenon is extremely mind bending. OK, 2 Corinthians 12, 10. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and in insults and in hardships and persecutions in difficulties. And then Paul makes the statement, when I am weak, then blank is strong. What would you fill into that gap? Well, when I ask this, most people will tell me when I am weak, then he is strong because that's what they remember and that's what makes sense. However, what it says now is when I am weak, then I am strong, which is not what most people remember and it doesn't make sense. OK, now this one is really strong for people. Hosea 4, 6. My people blank for lack of knowledge. What comes to mind? Quickly. My people blank for lack of knowledge. Well, if you said perish, you would be incorrect. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge is in every translation of the Bible. Furthermore, if you go to Amazon.com right now and you put in my people perish for lack of knowledge, you will not find one or two, but three books for sale right now 
called my people Paris for lack of knowledge. Now feel free to try to come up with some sort of cockamamie explanation for why a Bible believer would write a book called My People Perish for Lack of Knowledge when the passage says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Feel free. Okay, but this is evidence that our assertion is correct, that reality is changing, and that this is a remnant of the reality that we remember. I don't know how these certain things are left in this reality, but there it is. Okay, my people perish does not exist. Yet, here are three books written by people for sale that you understand this is not something that you can explain away is misremembering. Stop it. Genesis 28, your descendants will also be like the blank and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and in your descendants shall be the, this is so convoluted, the syntax, the wording is becoming purposely angular and twisted and it's, I watch pastors stumbling over as they're reading from the pulpit the, the, it's just jagged and they even will reinterpret from their memory as they're reading the scriptures. I've watched that happen many times now. I was in a King James only church and he was reading from the King James Bible because he's King James only and he's, and he's reading. And the greatest of these is love. Well, no, I'm looking at his King, the King James Bible and the greatest of these is charity. Love, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. That's what he said out of his mouth while he was looking at his Bible, which said charity. Because, because his conscience was bothering him. And you are thrust onto the horns of, of a dilemma at this moment because this is happening to you as well. And it is going up against a lifetime of a doctrine that the Bible can't change. And it's, it, it, I've tried to address the biblical paradox. God is not lying if this is happening, okay? Because you, are, you, you err not knowing the scriptures. You do not understand that the Bible hasn't promised you that, that it won't change. It's a dogma. And these are proofs. Your descendants will be like the sand of the sea. And your descendants shall be like the nations of the earth. That's what everybody remembers. But now it says the dust of the earth and the, and the families of the earth. Matthew 18, 20. For where there are two or blank are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. What do you remember? Two or more is what most people remember. But now it says two or three are gathered in my name. So, if you need counseling, <laughs> or if you can put me in touch with any pastors, or the boards of directors at denominations, or Bible publishing houses, or Bible colleges, please reach out to me. If you'd like to organize a debate or come on my channel, wake up or else, and, and show us how we're mistaken, how we're in error, please contact me. We'll have a live stream and we'll, we'll, you know, the goal of our doctrine, of our teaching is love from a pure heart. I'm not setting you up to smash you publicly, okay? We love God, we love his people. I don't think you're going to hell if you don't see the Bible changes. What I am saying is that this is a perilous, slippery slope that Christians need to get off of because the longer you stay in this mindset that the Bible can't change, the more perilous it becomes. Because what we believe is ultimately, this is going to be used to verify the veracity of the Antichrist's claims because everything that he says about himself is gonna be in your Bible. And Christians are gonna flip, they're gonna go, well, I guess I didn't know who Jesus was because everything this guy's saying is in his Bible. That's what's going to happen. So I hope that you will reach out to me at pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.
and I look forward to subscribe at Wake Up or Else so you'll get updated. You can sign up for the newsletter at wakeuporelse.com so we'll let you know what's happening and we look forward to talking to you soon. You have a great day.